thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit connectionpointchurch.org to share how God is using this church in your life or to support the ministry financially. Today's message is from our series AD, which follows along with the current series on NBC. In this series, we are exploring how Jesus' death and resurrection changed the world, but it's just the beginning of the story. Good to have you with us today. Wow. This is a, you know, we're in the middle of summer. Look at the crowds. God is still bringing us. I love this. About 60 of our college students are gone, and we still have that section full. I love it. Thank you for being there. I love this. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So we are, we are thrilled. As you noticed, if you had noticed, there's a balcony being built above your heads here. Uh, it's okay. It's, gonna be, it's safe, so don't worry about it. But uh, So it's very, very sturdy, and we've got uh, things going. And I promised Steve I wouldn't give any more time possibilities, but sometime in the next three weeks it should be done, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, I said, don't tell them that, Pastor. Don't tell them. We don't know how long. So somewhere during the summer, it'll be done this summer, right, Steve? We can say that much for sure. Probably by, by the end of July, we can probably have the back of the open, I think. But uh, <clears throat> yes, that gives you enough time, yeah. So things are looking good. Uh, I, I can't say enough about our deacons. Can I just, once again, just take a minute and say, our deacons are remarkable people. We have some great people who have great faith. Uh, you know, this, this whole journey of Connection Point Church has been one of the most remarkable adventures I've ever been privileged to be a part of. And uh, most pastors never have a chance to be a part of something like this. And I just feel like God has been so good to me. What an awesome church. What a great thing God is doing here. Wonderful hearts open just to what God is uh, wanting to accomplish. And, and you keep looking ahead. And I love it. I like a church that's forward-looking. We can all get stuck looking in the past. I know that. We can all feel like, well, things were better back then or things were better last year or whatever. You know, but we keep looking ahead. And our deacons have been doing that. Uh, as I said before, just so you're aware of this, this, this project right here, uh, I've been trying, you know, it wasn't my idea. Ah, like, it's something else. Usually I try to tell them, this is, get, this, let's get this going for the future. But they were looking ahead. And the Leon and the deacons said, you know what, we need to get, we need to get the balcony because we believe that there's going to be some growth coming in the fall. It's already coming now, but it's going to be more in the fall. We believe that God has got great plans for this church because it has a great heart for God. And I want to say thank you to our deacons again. Thank you publicly for their heart, for what they're doing to accomplish God's plan, to prepare for the future. And that's what you want, a church that keeps looking ahead. Not stuck in the present or the past, but looking at what God has in mind for us. And I, and I just uh, appreciate so much their hearts and their vision. And that makes it easy to pastor a church when you've got leadership like that around you. It really makes it wonderful. And so just let them know you appreciate them because this is part of the dream. Uh, when we get the balcony done, all the projects are finished in this building. Then we have to work on the next building. No, not yet, not yet. Okay, they'll be coming down the road. But I do believe... Uh, if we have the growth that I anticipate, I believe God's going to send. I believe it's going to be not too long down the road uh, that God's going to require uh, a foresight, some more foresight, some more faith, and a lot of trusting in what God is accomplishing and, and going forward. Uh, along with that, let me just say, how many here are first-time guests? Let me see your hand. First time with us. Anybody here first time? Thank you for coming. God bless you. God bless you, friends. If you're looking for a good place to call home, this is it. Can I just tell you, uh, you I've been, uh, I won't say how long I've been around, but I've been around a while and pastors for a number of years and I travel for district office and travel for national office for a number of years and been to a lot of churches, not only in America, but also overseas. And I wouldn't trade any of them for this one. This is it. This is, as, I think it's about as good as it gets right here. I'm, I'm sold on this place. And you know what? I'm sold on what God is doing here. So you come and join us. Be a part of what God is doing here. And uh, we're going to be making more room so we can keep growing. And that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, how many have been watching the TV series called... Uh, oh, before I get to that, let me just take a minute. <laughs> I like to talk a little bit before I start preaching. Is that okay if I do that? I, I want to say, uh, is, is, is Andrew and Rachel here? The Shrovas? Well, there you are. I kept looking for you. Stand up, guys. This couple... 
a wonderful part of the church. They just recently moved. They were part of uh, Chi Alpha here on the campus, Purdue campus, and they've gone all the way up to Wisconsin, far, a far country from here. But God has called them there, and this is their last official time with us. Am I right? This is your last Sunday. And uh, can you come up for a minute? We want to pray for you before we get into the Word. Ask God to bless this precious couple. We are thankful for them. His father pastors an inner, I guess, church in the city there. And uh, it's a, which town is that now? Madison. That's why I was going to say Madison. Make sure I get the right town. Madison, Wisconsin. And they're going back to be a, a big help to the church there and a part of the ministry reaching out. And I think that's pretty awesome, guys. So can I ask our deacons to come and we'll lay hands on them? Will you stand with me just for a minute as we ask God to touch them? Uh, I do believe that they're still part of our church, even though they may be in Wisconsin. I don't let people go that easily, okay? You're still part of what God's doing here. But I believe God will bless them. I believe God will anoint them. I believe that God will send them. And we want to be part of that sending, okay? So let's just reach out your hands toward them right now. Let's ask for Andrew and Rachel to feel God's presence and to have that assurance deep in their heart, deep in their soul, that they are doing what God has called them to do. Let's just begin to pray. Father, we ask for your hand to rest upon this precious couple. You've been with them, Lord. They've dedicated their lives to you. They've served you, Lord, faithfully for a number of years here at Chi Alpha here at Purdue, and I just ask God that you'll be with them as they go back to Wisconsin, Lord, as they set up their household there, as they prepare, Lord, to help in their father's church, as they're reaching out to the lost around them. I pray, God, you'll make them fruitful. Give them a great harvest, I pray. May they sense, God, your presence, your support, your help in all that they do. And God, may they know without a doubt that this is your call upon them. Give them that assurance, we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Love you guys. We love you. God bless you. God bless you so much. Amen. Amen. It's just so neat to have people like this called to ministry who are serving God faithfully. God bless you. God bless you so much. Let me also remind you that... uh, there's an outing, a family outing on June 27th, that's a Saturday evening. We're going to have a, uh, a big section of the, I guess at the Indianapolis Indians game in the stadium there will be a section just for CPC, about 100 of us will be there. We do have a few tickets still available. And if you'd like to get one, or perhaps you've got a family member you forgot about <laughs> and didn't get a ticket for them yet, uh, pick up your tickets if you've already got tickets on hold. But we also want to know that there are extra tickets available. So we have a few left over. When they're gone, they're gone. We only had so many tickets that we could pick up. So uh, it will be a fun night. Sue and I plan to go. It's going to be a great time. So looking forward to fellowship with you and a lot of fun as well. So it's going to be great. Amen. So good to have guests with us from even from Illinois, some, some friends of, of Lee and Arlene. I guess actually not friends, but family members. Good to have you folks with us. God bless you. Pastors in Peoria as well. So thank you for being here. God bless. Good to have you here today. This is a wonderful time in which we can follow the Lord, isn't it? These are not good, not easy times, but they're wonderful in the sense that God has a plan for all of us. As you've been watching the AD series, you've realized that, that God, you know, in the early church, boy, what an exciting adventure they had. I believe God's got the same adventure for us today. He wants us to just step out and have that kind of faith. Today's topic is called Too Hot to Handle. That's the sermon topic, Too Hot to Handle. People often wonder what God will say on the other side of eternity. When I get to heaven, I, of course, want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. I think that's what all of us want to hear. That's a pretty good thing to hear from God as we enter his presence. Living your life for the gospel is worth it. Can I say that again? Living your life for the gospel is worth it. Going to new places to share the good news of Jesus Christ is something you'll never regret because because the greatest miracle, hear me, the greatest miracle God performs is change lives. When there's change lives, people come into the kingdom. That is the greatest miracle you will ever, ever, ever see. Our mission team, Matt Zickman and, and of course, Zach and and the rest of them, uh, each of those members that went to the DR can tell you this it's fresh on their mind, just firsthand. They came back and they saw 
change lives. It's awesome. Awesome. When you're transformed, you can't help but catch, catch a vision to go. To go. When you commit your lives to Jesus Christ, you commit to a lifelong adventure. And a great adventure to go where you've never been before. Sound like one of those space goddesses, doesn't it? To go where you've never been before. And that's what it is like. But soon I came to, when I came to the Lord, I didn't even think I'd be called to ministry. But then a few years later, I called to ministry. Went prepared for at a, at a Bible college in Missouri and met my wife there. And, of course, we got married there. And then, and then little did we ever expect, you know, the adventure started. I call it the, it's one of the great, there's two great adventures in life. When you marry, that's a great adventure. It's always an adventure. Every single day, nothing's the same. Some days it's great, some days it's a little more challenging, but it's, it's a great adventure. But you're in it together. I like that. And the same with the Lord. When you come to Christ, it's a great adventure. You'll, you'll be going where you've never gone before. If you've been watching the 80s series, uh, how many have you been watching that TV series on Sunday nights? It's worth watching, by the way. If it comes out again, make sure you stay tuned and, and, and watch it or get the... Uh, some people can download that, can't you, from, uh, I don't know how you do all that stuff. That technology is way beyond me. But uh, you can watch it again probably later. But recently we saw the changed life of a man named Saul. He was converted on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to persecute, to track down, and to imprison followers of Christ. That's what his purpose was. That's what he was going to do. And he was good at it because he had already done it in Jerusalem area. He was headed towards Damascus to do this. And so, so we see the life of Saul, who later becomes Paul. After Saul's dra- I mean, dramatic encounter with Jesus, you can read it in Acts chapter 9, he was transformed. And Saul, Saul the persecutor became Saul the proclaimer. Just overnight, he began the people he was, the one he was persecuting now becomes the one he's proclaiming. He caught a vision to go, a vision to go and proclaim the good news to all the world, that Jesus Christ is, he is the Son of God. And we see, the great, we see this great picture of Saul, his great zeal, in Acts chapter 9. I'll read it to you beyond the screen behind me. It says this, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began, at once, he didn't wait a few years, but at once he began to proclaim, to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and they, and they, were, and they asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more Powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan, and day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. You might say he's a basket case, (laughs) but I won't say that. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. I wonder why. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Not believing that he really was, that he really was a disciple, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he told them how Saul on the journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them, and he moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea, and they sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. Wow. Wow. I want to talk to you about the urgency of the goal, G-O, the urgency of the goal. In this passage, we see Saul consumed with one goal in mind, and that is to make Jesus known. It turned out that he was too hot to handle. 
For those that were established in that area, he was too hot to handle, too hot to handle for the Jews and too hot to handle for the Christians. It was, he was really red hot when it came to all this tension that was being developed around his life. He was rejected and then he was redirected. Redirected to a safe distance. Yet God never promises safety. Do you hear me? God never promises safety in living out the gospel. There are so many believers that think that God has promised me a perfect life. Nothing will ever go wrong. Nothing will ever hurt me again. Nothing will ever be tarnished or, or create pain for me ever. That's not what the gospel promises. Hear me. God never promised safety in living out the gospel. Potential, yes, he promised potential. Purpose, yes, he promised purpose. Power, yes, he promised us power. Safety, no. Wow. To assume living for Jesus is safe is to miss the adventure, to miss the intensity of the goal. You take the risk. You've put your life on the line to go and proclaim Jesus Christ. You are doing that. The disciples were skeptical of Saul. The Jews were lethal. I mean, lethal. The city was dangerous, yet nothing could stop Saul from powerfully proclaiming fiercely, fearlessly and boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ to his world. As Saul moved from persecutor to proclaimer, he grew in his commitment, his commitment to the urgency to go. Now, repeatedly through Scripture, throughout Scriptures, we're told to go. Saul's not the only one that received that command to go. As a matter of fact, it's given to all of us. We're all told to go. In fact, the word go shows up 1,400 times in the Word of God. We can never, hear me, we can never mistake the Bible as encouraging inactivity. The Bible never encourages inactivity. The Bible always encourages us being involved, being active, and going. That's what we're supposed to be doing. It decisively reveals the urgency of God's call to go. It reveals this, as we'll read it, that God wants us to do something for him. Look at some examples real quick. Abram. Genesis chapter 12, we see the story of Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. It's interesting that Abram was called from a place before he was called to a place. Sometimes you don't know exactly where we're headed, but we know we're out to leave. We are to go. And God will show us a place. I remember that happened to Sue and I many years ago. We were in a, I was a, a youth pastor of my home church, and I felt God speak to us that we were supposed to find a place to pastor. And I was novice. I was green behind the ears. I had no experience. I came from a layman's home. I didn't know what it was like to get a, to find a church. Why do you find a church? I just figured you got in your car and you drove and found a church. That's how naive I was. So I said, Sue, we're gonna, I'm going to quit my job. We're going to go find a church. And a friend of mine happened to call about that time I was making this decision. And he lived out in, in uh, Colorado. And he said, hey, he said, uh, he said, I, matter of fact, I called in Colorado. I had a friend out there, a previous pastor. I said, hey, we're going to go looking for a church. He said, well, won't you come out here? Our, our big council meeting starts in just a couple of weeks. Would you come out here? And there's probably a few little churches out here. It'd be a good place to start. I said, well, you know what? We'll do that. So I had a goal. I had going to go drive to Colorado, find a church. About the same time, a friend of ours called who was working on staff at a church at Farmington, New Mexico. <laughs> and he he calls me and says, hey, what are you guys doing? I said, we're, we're going to go find a church. I said, we're going to drive up to Colorado. I think I could have a chance to meet some people there, maybe find a church in Colorado. And he says, why don't you come by? We're on the way, which he wasn't, but he said he's on the way. I didn't have a good map then. I didn't look that close. I didn't have a Google. I didn't have a computer. So I said, oh, wonderful. Let's just come along. He said, he said, tell you what, it won't be much out of your way. He said, you come, and I'll give you the extra gas money to come by and just spend a couple days with us as you go up to, up to, as you make your way up to Colorado. I said, oh, great. So Sue and I load up our little baby boy, and we load up our little car, and I had hardly any money. I was, it was a tight budget. We didn't have any resources, hardly at all. 
We get in the car and we start driving towards New Mexico from Missouri. <laughs> and we get out to New Mexico. And we get there, we're watching our pennies. We're driving almost all night because we can't afford to stay in a motel. So we get to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it was early in the morning. And we sit there at the mall. We wait and wait till a decent hour to call somebody. And we call up Mr. Van Zandt. He was the overseer of the churches in New Mexico. And I gave him a call at his home on Saturdays. You don't do that. You don't call the overseer of the big area on a Saturday in his home. You're supposed to call his office and talk to him there. So I didn't know any difference. So I called his house. And I said, hey, this is, I'm Ted Bruss. My wife and I are here at the mall, and, and we, we're looking for a church. <laughs> so he, uh, he says, I'll meet you in a few minutes. Can you meet? So you're, there's a place, a restaurant, he named a restaurant close by. He said, can you meet me at that restaurant? I said, well, yeah, we can meet you there. He said, I'll be there in just a few minutes. He said, I don't live too far away. I said, well, good. So he's going to meet us at the restaurant. We walk in the restaurant, and there's this guy. And I, on the way over, I said, Sue, don't buy anything. Just, just get a glass of water, maybe a, some, some, some little juice to drink. So we can't afford, our budget's so tight, we can't afford to even eat breakfast this morning. Money to get there and back for car expense. That's about it. I said, you just eat, you know, just drink something. So we get there, and he comes in, and he's looking around, and he sees us, and he says, are you Mr. and Mrs. Bruss? I say, yeah. So I go over, and I shake his hand, and so he has to sit down. He says, I'm going to buy you breakfast. Oh, we had breakfast finally. So we had breakfast. <laughs> had a good breakfast. So we had our breakfast. And he says, I've got a gold mine. He said, I want to, can, I, can you get time? I want to take you down and show it to you. I said, well, yeah, we'll get time. We, we're looking for a church. So he takes us in his car, we park our car, we take his car, he drives us down to the little valley and he shows us a little place where this little bitty, I mean a little shack of a building, little, little wood building and it had slat pews and it didn't have any carpet, it had just wood, uh, just park of you know, subflooring, it's all head down. It had a bare light bulb sh- sh- hanging from the ceiling and it was just one, a one room building, it had a, at the back corner was a little room for a bathroom was about it and a little nursery is it, pretty much a, what, one big room. And so he takes us down there, he shows us, and he talks to us about the potential down there and all this stuff. He calls it a gold mine. And so, uh, so we were looking at it, and I said, well, this, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, you know, this is good. I didn't know any difference. So we're driving back, and he takes us to a hotel, and he puts us up. On the way back, he said, did you preach tomorrow? I said, okay. Uh, and I didn't realize you had to preach to candidate or try out for a church. I thought you'd just go find a church, and it's your church. So I didn't, I didn't come with a sermon. I didn't come with anything at all to preach. I really wasn't ready. I didn't bring any sermon notes with me. But I had my Bible. I said, well, yeah, I'll preach. He said, we need to preach twice tomorrow, Sunday morning and Sunday night. I said, okay, I'll preach. So I feel like I've got to be up half the night studying now for, to get a message together. So, we, so he takes us to the hotel, and he puts us in the hotel, and, and Sue and I are just overwhelmed. We're sitting there looking at each other. I say, wow, you know, this is, this is remarkable. This is something else. You know, this is, re- what is wow, this is fantastic. And about, <laughs> about an hour later, bang, 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 bang on the door. Bang, 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 bang. And somebody's frantically banging on the door. I get up. I'm reading the Bible, trying to get some notes written down. I go to the door, and I, says, I said, hello. He says, this is Mr. Vans. He says, he says, who are you? I says, I'm Ted. That's my wife, Sue, because I introduced myself to him earlier. He says, no, but who are you? I says, what do you mean, who are we? We're from, I says, we are from, from Missouri. He says, Missouri? He said, I was supposed to meet a young couple this morning from Kansas. He said, and their name was Brown, and yours was Rust. So it started the B. So in his mind, it was that couple he thought he met at the restaurant. We were the Browns. He thought we were the Kansas couple coming. He says, I got back to the house after spending almost all day with you folks. I get back to the house. We didn't have cell phones back in those days. Thank goodness. And uh, he gets back to the house. His wife says, well, there's a phone call from the Browns. They can't make it. They already, had a, they already found a church in Kansas. So he says, who are you? I says, I'm Ted. That's Sue. <laughs> Who are you? 
He says, will you still preach tomorrow? I said, well, yeah, if you want me to. I said, this is quite a, you know, I said, wow, we. So we preach the next day, and we leave from there, go up to see our friends, and never give me a penny towards gas. I never brought that up to him again. However, he may hear this message. Who knows? So, <laughs> so he never helped us with the gas expense. Anyway, so, so we get up there and spend a couple days with him, and we get the phone call that they had a little meeting with that little group of about seven, ten people. So it wasn't many people there. And it's just a, it's a pioneer work, just getting started. So we're going to, and they voted unanimously that we'd be their pastor. <laughs> so we never made it to Colorado. We turned around from there, went back to Missouri and got our stuff and moved out to, out to Albuquerque area. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I'm talking about an adventure. I mean, we were, whatever God asked us to do, we felt we would do it. We were willing to do whatever he asked of us. And I was naive, yes. I had a lot of things to learn. I would never advise that to anybody ever again to do something like that. <laughs> I, would never, I would never recommend that. But God gave us the adventure of a life. We looked back upon wow and said, wow, look at how God opened the doors at just the right time and how everything came together. Now, if I had the time, I'd tell you how we came here because it was even more miraculous here. When God brought us here, it was a miracle. In many, many fronts, God brought us here. I've always felt that our, this should be an adventure. Life is never boring as a believer. It should be boring. If we really do believe that God has called us and we've said yes to his call, then God wants us to be actively doing something, actively going. Find a way to serve him. Find a way to reach out. So always be active. And so every time God said go, great things happen. Abraham went, what happened? He built a great nation for God. God used him. Look at Moses. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses was not, he was not the cream of the crop at that time. He had passed his potential, so to speak. He was an outsider with a complicated past. He was not eloquent. Matter of fact, he had hard time talking. He stuttered or whatever his speech impediment was. He had some challenges there and he had trouble controlling his anger. He had anger issues. Yet God chose him to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt. And because God equips those he calls, Moses couldn't fail if he would just obey God. So I'm trying to tell you, if we just but obey God, we cannot fail. Moses was an unlikely person to follow the call to go. And so was Saul. So was Ted. And so are you. Not always the most likely person, but God calls. And if he calls, he equips. And if he equips, he will take care of you and it will, you will have success for the kingdom if you will obey him. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. I don't know about you, but I think God is asking us to be willing to step out. Be willing to be active. Not just sit side and observe and critique and, and act bored and act indifferent. I do believe that the world will be changed if all Christians would take seriously this call to go. It would transform our world today. You've got people like Ananias, chapter 9. The, the Lord said to him, said to him, go, go to the house of Judas on State, I sort of say State Street, Straight Street. <laughs> the state last time, didn't I? And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Ananias probably wished he was anywhere but in Damascus when he heard those words from God. Here in this passage, God tells him to go see Saul. Now, th think about that. The man, Saul, to go see the very man whose purpose was to travel all the way to your hometown where you're living and to kill you. That's what he was coming to do. He was coming to kill Ananias and all of his friends who were believers that lived in Damascus. Now, if God had said go to someone like that, you would have a hard time going. I'm sure of that. 
Understandably, Ananias questioned God's plan. Who wouldn't question God's plan? Yet, we see God reaffirming his command in Acts chapter 9. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, there it is again, This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So God wanted Ananias to see the urgency of the goal, even when it was dangerous and scary. I, you know, this world is dangerous and it's scary, but there's an urgency to get out there and proclaim the good news, to live Christ-like, to have a lantern, to have a light, to have, a, to have this ability to touch our world. We must be active about what God has called us to do. And Ananias did go. Dangerous, yes. Scary, yes. But he went. You know something? Because he went, he caused the greatest, greatest missionary in history to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says, Acts chapter 9. When Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. And he got up, and he was baptized. These are just a few of the scriptures that point us to the fact that, that there's an urgency to go. We must be urgent about the call to go. This can help us to understand some of the reason why Saul felt such an urgent need to go and proclaim the truth. And that should be ours as well. We should be urgent about proclaiming the truth. God continues to send people to encourage them to go. We, I do believe God wants to equip us. And there's many reasons I could give you some of those roadblocks. But I just want to just get to the, to, the, to the latter part of my message. Just talk about some things that will help us as we go forward as believers. Let me just tell you something. Embracing God's call to go will cost you something. It always has, it always will. There's no question about that. For you to embrace the goal means that, that you, might, you might lose a relationship. You might, following God across, across the globe may be part of it. Maybe, maybe just this thing about cruising to retirement is not what's going to happen because you're going to invest your life in God more than in your personal future. There are many who will walk away from the goal because they just want to understand before they take the first step. There are so many of us who want to know the full plan. We want to know the end result before we start. I'm here like that. When God tells you something, you say, well, God, I want to see exactly how it's going to turn out before I start. That's not the way it works. That's not, what was the commercial goal? That's not the way you, that's not what a, how a wall works. Have you seen that commercial about the ladies? Okay, maybe not. The picture's on the wall. Okay. That's not how it works. That's not what happens. It's not that we have to know every detail before we start. If God asks us to go, we start. And then once we start, God will unfold his plan as we go. And we will, if we're obedient to him, we will succeed. We will accomplish what God has in mind for us. A lot of people shy away from the goal because they just want to know everything before they start. They want to know all the details. They want to know the destination. They want to know exactly how this is going to happen out there. They just won't start. God doesn't work that way. Whether it's the first step in overcoming an addiction, embracing deeper relationships with God, or serving in a greater way, I have, I have yet to meet, I have yet to meet someone who chose to go and never regretted it. I regret none of the things that God allowed to come our pathway. Some were very painful, yes. Some were, and I wouldn't want to repeat them. I wouldn't sign up again for it necessarily, but. By walking with him, God took care of us. He provided for us. He met every need. God took care of us. He sure did. There's a song I, I want to just called The Heavenly Vision. 
This song has meant a lot to a lot of believers who've gone through suffering over the years. The author's name is Helen Lemmel, L-E-M-M-E-L. Helen wrote this song from her small government subsidized apartment. Her husband had left her a few years before because she had gone through uh, some health complications and because of health complications she became blind. And her husband left her. She had hardly any money to live. She had nothing much to this world. But God gave her these words and she wrote them down. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying and his perfect salvation to tell. That's what she wrote. The reality is this, that God has a goal for you, a goal for me, for every single one of us today. He isn't a passive God. You hear me? God is not a passive God. He's an active God. Jesus spoke about a heavenly Father who loves the people of this world so much that he would go from the 99 and go out and find the one sheep that was lost. He is the one who chose this crazy, overzealous Pharisee named Saul to become his leader in the early church. A man who almost got himself killed two weeks into his preaching ministry. So no sooner he gets going, he almost gets killed. For most of us in this room, the goal isn't to become a missionary or to put your life on the line tomorrow. For many of you, the goal is to become a better parent. The goal is starting a faith-filled conversation with, with perhaps your neighbor or people at work. The goal is to is writing a check for one of God's sons or daughters who are across the world being a missionary who needs support. For some of you, the goal is to get healthy so that God can give you a better goal. You won't have all the answers. We never do. If I had all the answers, I could make millions of dollars writing a book about all the answers for each person's life. You may not even know where the resources come from. You might even be called crazy by some of the folks around you. And you may even be terrified by the process because it is sometimes scary <laughs> to be out away from everything that you're familiar with and follow the goal. But when you go, hear me, when you go, you don't go alone. In your going, there's going to be a greater awareness of Jesus Christ than you've ever had before. In your go, there's a greater sense of the reason for why you're here, for what God has as a purpose for your life as you go. I believe God has a go, G-O, for each one of us. He doesn't want us to be passive, to sit back and just watch and not be involved. He has something for every one of us. I want our worship team to come back. I want all of us to stand as we prepare to respond to what God is saying to us today. I want you to hear this carefully. This next few words I'm saying are very, very important. Vitally important. If we will all respond to our own go from God, what he has for us, the G-O from God, if we'll all respond to that and say yes to it, I believe God will do more in the next generation than the world has ever seen before. If all believers would just say yes to God and follow the go, technology has allowed us to bring the gospel to billions. Every people group in the world will have access to the gospel within the next 10 years. That has never happened before. Every people group will have the gospel in their language, either spoken or written. Even Hollywood's responding by, by putting literally millions of dollars into biblical epics. 
The AD series is one of those on television, reaching millions of people each week. Teenagers and young adults all around America and all around the world are longing to see God move. They're seeking God passionately. Our kids came back from camp this past few days, and they've had a wonderful week. God moved among them. They have a hunger for God. Desperate to live lives. Desperate to live lives with the kind of fire that Saul had, that he lived with years ago. I believe it's for us today. That fire, that vision, that, that goal, that call of God to move out for him. It's here today. The church, I think, is ready. We know how desperate our times are. We are living in un, unprecedented times. And it's time for us to go. It's time for us to respond. It's time for each one of us to say yes to God's call in our lives. If each one of us will say yes to God when he says to go, if we'll let him be the center of our lives, we will find ourselves in the midst of perhaps the greatest movement of God ever to come upon planet Earth. It can happen and it can start right here. It starts right there in our lives. But it requires us stepping up. Stepping out to follow God even when we don't know what the outcome will be. But it will change our world if we'll step out. Today is the day to go. Today is the day to respond to God's call in your life, in my life. Imagine what your family would be like if you would respond to God. What would it look like a month from now if you as parents would respond to God? What would it look like a month from now if every young person, every adult would respond to God? Well, how would that transform my family? Imagine what our churches would look like if every single one of us would say yes to God's call to go. We would have to build more than just a balcony. <laughs> If everybody here felt the call to, to speak and to do and to be active for the kingdom, we would we'd have to build another building before you knew it. We'd have to go to two or three services because there's no place for the people. We'd have that many people looking and coming because this church is out there proclaiming, following the call to go. Imagine the difference this nation, what it would have looked like if every believer, if every church, if every family would listen to God and follow the goal, the goal, it would transform the landscape of our country. It would change the complexity of every community. It would heal so many wounds, so many things going on and so wrong in our culture today. If we as God's people would listen to the goal, he says, go into all of your world. Proclaim the gospel. Let's respond to God. Let's embrace what he has for us. We don't have to know the next thing. If he'll just say yes to him and begin the journey, begin to be active, and he'll, un he'll disclose things to you as you go along. He'll open those doors for you. You'll see his hand. You'll see what he has in mind for you. Let's be the church that will go. How many want to join me? Is that your heart's desire? Will you obey God? Will you listen to Him? Will you obey Him and not just be complacent and sit back, but you'll be a person who actually declares and speaks and, and shares the love of Christ to the world around you, your family, your neighborhood, your workplace, your community, your world. That's what God wants from us. Can I ask for those that want to go? You want to just follow God? You want to be obedient to what He says to you? Just step right out and just come and join me at the altar. If it's too many, if we got too many people here, just fill up the aisles as well. But I think it's going to be time for us to commit our lives. I want to be like Saul. I want to be like the early Christians, don't you? I want to be one of those people that transform my world because I'm willing to obey what Christ is asking of me. I'm willing 
to obey the command to go into my world and preach and share the gospel. Anyone else be willing to step out, make a deeper commitment, a deeper commitment. Let's respond to God's word today, friends. Let's embrace his call to us. He has a call for you. He has a command to go for you. Trust him. Obey him. You'll never be sorry you did. You'll be glad you followed Jesus.